All right, Mark chapter 4, if you'll open up your Bibles with me. Mark 4, and uh, this morning we're going to be in verses 26 to 29. So, uh, most of you know, before coming here, I was uh, in Missouri for about nine years at two different churches. Um, thinking back to uh, church I was at right out of seminary, a couple churches ago, I was associate pastor at uh, First Baptist Church in Willow Springs, Missouri. And I still remember very clearly a, um, a quotation that uh, the senior pastor there had hanging on his wall in his office. It was a quotation by Martin Luther, uh, one that I've come across many times since then. It's, it's a somewhat famous uh, quote of Martin Luther's. Martin Luther was, uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, lead reformers in the Protestant Reformation going all the way back to the 1500s. Right? God used him to uh, bring reformation to the church, uh, to correct some teachings in the Catholic Church, uh, to bring about uh, the kind of churches that, well, the kind of church you're in this morning, right? A, uh, a church that uh, relies upon the sole authority of Scripture. And here's what he said, uh, reflecting back on, on how God used him to bring about this Reformation, this uh, recovery of biblical Christianity. Here's what he said. He said, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then, while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip of Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. And so that was Luther's insistence, right? As he's looking back and seeing how God used him to bring about this reformation in the church, to bring the church back to the sole authority of Scripture and, and to, to correct the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church at that time, uh, to, to bring about a, a, a vibrant Christian faith. He said, the Word did it all. He taught, he preached, he wrote God's Word, and he let it do its work. In my ministry as your pastor, I want you to know that, that that's what I'm banking on. I'm banking on the power of God's Word to do such a work. We all need reformation even in our own lives, right? We can think about it on the broader scale of, of church history and, and, uh, and, and see how the church was in desperate need of reformation at that time. Um, in fact, one, one of the uh, key mottos of the Re Reformation was always reforming. We always need to be going back to God's Word, going back to uh, the basics. And uh, that's true in the church, uh, for the church at large, but it's also true even in our own lives. And, uh, and we, we must rely upon God's Word, um, and that's, uh, that's of uh, first most importance. Um, so that's what I'm banking on, but I, I hope that uh, you'll see in this passage that that's what you ought to bank on as well, right? Uh, that, that you ought to bank on God's Word as your authority and as, as something that has power uh, to, to change and, and to bring about a true, vibrant faith. Uh, I think we'll see that in our passage this morning. This is yet another seed parable, uh, and so... Uh, Again, we're going to be in Mark 4, 26 through 29. Would you go ahead and stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Mark 4, beginning in verse 26. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Let's pray. God, we thank you for yet uh, another parable that is uh, to open our eyes to the power of your word. And so I pray, Lord, that um, you will even show us that power now as, as, as we uh, look to this passage, uh, but then more broadly, Lord, I pray that uh, you will help us uh, to shed light on all of God's Word and how we ought to uh, rely upon it and, uh, and that it uh, will, in fact, do its work. And so uh, we, we want to see that and understand that and trust in that this morning. So we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to do that 
and by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, even in our scientific age, uh, there's something mysterious, something magical about planting a seed in the ground and watching it grow. Right? We, can, we can understand some of the scientific explanation of it, but it's still quite mysterious, even magical. Um, there, there is an incredible self-contained power within a seed, and we're going to see that uh, next week as well as, as Jesus continues to talk about seeds, and uh, we think about how even large plants can come from the tiniest of seeds. It's really an incredible thing. Um, not only will we see it next week, but uh, last week, right, we, we saw um, uh, a seed parable as well, or even two weeks ago, right? Uh, a lot of, as I've pointed out, a lot of these parables that Jesus gives are kind of agrarian in nature. So, for example, the first parable, two parables that we looked at, um, well, first of all, it's important that we understand that the seed in this parable is the word, just as it was in the first parable, right? Jesus, right, and, and, the, and the seed being scattered on uh, the different kinds of soil and the rocky path and, and, the, and the thorny ground and, and so on. Ultimately, of course, uh, we, we want that seed to fall on good soil. But the seed, Jesus says, in that parable is the word. And so it is here. And so... Um, we learn in that first parable that the seed is the word. We do also learn in that first parable that the soil conditions matter, right? Uh, that uh, we need our hearts softened by God's Spirit for that seed to take root. But the focus, uh, especially in the parable this morning, the focus is on the seed, on the word. And so Jesus begins this parable by saying, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now, uh, I should remind you that uh, the kingdom of God, uh, this is the rule and reign of God. Right? It's not talking about one physical location. It's not talking uh, about the, the throne room of heaven or, or not that alone. But the kingdom, the kingdom of God is wherever the rule and reign of God is. The kingdom of God is here, right, in the church. And so, and so what Jesus is saying here is when he says the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he's saying that this is how it begins, right? The, the growth of God's kingdom began, begins simply by scattering seed. And so that's going to be the first of three points this morning. We're going to have scattering seed, resting in faith, and then reaping the harvest. And that kind of uh, corresponds with, uh, with the title, uh, Sowing, Sleeping, and Reaping, right? Uh, that's, that's kind of the flow of this passage. And so first with the sowing, or with the scattering of seed. That's our first heading this morning. And, uh, of course, Jesus says that this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is how the kingdom of God begins. This is how it grows. And that's what Jesus himself was doing, Right? We understand that as Jesus traveled about and taught the word, that he was scattering seed. Uh, Jesus has uh, often been called uh, the, uh, an itinerant rabbi, which is just a fancy way of saying that he was a traveling teacher. And uh, with his disciples in tow, he went and he scattered seed. Remember, early in Mark, we, we said that uh, we saw that Jesus said uh, that he wanted to go out and preach. For this is why I came, he said. Right? He came, first and foremost, to preach the word, to go and to scatter seed. And that's what he does as, as, as we make our way through Mark, through all the Gospels. We see that, um, you know, our, our family, we've been watching The Chosen lately, and, uh, and I think that kind of helps uh, give kind of a mental picture of what the day-to-day would have looked like as they were traveling about um, and, uh, and scattering seed. That's what Jesus was about. And not only that, not only did he uh, scatter seed as he preached the word, but he taught his disciples to do the same. And then ultimately, he sent them out as apostles to continue in this work. Right? This is, again, how the kingdom of God advances. This is how the kingdom of God grows. Right? So Jesus is scattering seed. He's training his disciples, and then he sends them out as apostles to do the same. Now, the apostles, uh, that is the capital A apostles, right, they're no longer with us. That age has passed. Um, but in a sense, it's very important for us to understand that we are all apostles. That is, we are all sent out as well 
to scatter seed. And so I'm going to come back and, and land hard on that. Um, but first, let's just consider that e- even though we don't have the capital A apostles around anymore, um, it is true that we have missionaries, evangelists, pastors, uh, whose very vocation is to scatter the seed of God's word. So we might see somewhat of a parallel uh, with uh, Jesus and his disciples and then uh, him sending them out. Uh, we, we, we see that uh, even in our day we have those whose very vocation, whose very calling, whose very career is to do this. And um, as, we, as we think about uh, their role, um, well, uh, it's important that we understand that this requires a confidence in God's word. All right, we think about Jesus. We think about the, the confidence that Jesus had in the Word as he went and preached the Word, and the disciples uh, who, who later went out and did the same. And then even as we move along in church history, we see people like Martin Luther. Again, that quote, right? He said, I just preached, taught, and wrote God's Word. And he did nothing else. He said, the Word did it all. There is a kind of confidence that is required of those whose vocation is to scatter the seed of God's word. And, uh, of course, uh, in this room, I'm the only one who is of that vocation. Uh, but understand, it's, it's not only pastors, but it's, we, we can think of missionaries, evangelists, pastors, th- those, those who, who go out uh, and, and do this um, uh, as, as their um, vocation. Uh, it's, it's important that we, um, even, even as you and the Pews, it's important for you to realize that, uh, that this is not only a responsibility of evangelists and missionaries and pastors, yes, it's also your own responsibility, but it's also your responsibility to ensure that missionaries, evangelists, and pastors, and so on, are, are doing this as they ought to. You know, if, if you're a discerning hearer, you can tell pretty quickly uh, whether a minister's confidence is in God's Word or in something else. Again, whether we're, we're talking about a, a, a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor or whatever, someone who is, let's say, delivering God's Word or delivering a message to the people, uh, oftentimes uh, you, can, uh, you can tell quite quickly where their confidence is. Is it in God's Word or is it perhaps in something else. You know, sometimes uh, it seems like the Bible's just kind of a cherry on top, but I think what we see in this passage, what we see uh, again with the example that's set for us is that God's Word uh, is, um, is, is what uh, uh, really does the work. Uh, Paul speaks uh, some relevant words to Timothy on this matter, and to us, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 3 says this, he says, preach the Word be prepared in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and encourage with every form of patient instruction. For the time will come when men will not tolerate sound doctrine, but with itching ears they will gather around themselves teachers to suit their own desires. And so what we see here on one hand is that there is a personal responsibility, as, again, as we think of uh, missionaries and evangelists and pastors, various teachers in the church. We see that there is a responsibility on their part to preach the word, right? That's what Paul is telling Timothy to do, preach the word. But at the same time, the church has a responsibility to receive and to affirm and to support such teaching, right? As opposed to gathering around themselves teachers to suit their own desires. So, of course, this applies in um, calling pastors, calling elders in a church. Uh, this, this applies in uh, any church and the leadership that they put in place. But even, even the, the books that you read, the people you watch on TV, the people you listen to, the uh, question is, are you receiving and affirming and supporting those who preach the word, those who are spreading the seed, those who are placing their confidence in the power of God's word or perhaps something else. And that can be entertainment or pop psychology or mere motivational speaking. Uh, all kinds of things can take the place of God's word. And so uh, we must be aware of that. Um, 
But God forbid that it's just missionaries and evangelists and pastors and teachers who are spreading seed. Uh, again, and this is what I want to land hard on, is that all of us are called to spread the seed of God's Word. And so again, as we consider the first verse of this passage, uh, that the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, understand all of us in our own ways are to scatter seed, right? You may not uh, be, well, none of us are apostles, uh, but you may not, uh, at least with the capital A, um, you may not be a uh, missionary or an evangelist or a pastor, but we all are sent out as apostles, lowercase a. And by the way, I, I'm, I'm using this as a distinction, of course. Uh, and when we see the word apostle, this is just kind of a side note, okay? So in, in the New Testament, uh, we see that uh, there, were, there were the apostles who had the authority given to them by Jesus to, to, to preach the word, even to write the very words of Scripture. Right? They had an apostolic authority. And so, so they were what we might call apostles with a big A. Even though, understand, in, in the Greek, there's not this distinction of the capital, and, capital A and lowercase a. Uh, we have to do the, the hard work to understand that, uh, obviously, there were two different categories of apostles in, uh, in the sense that there were those who had this authority, but then also recognizing that uh, in, in a lesser sense, in a more general sense, in a lowercase a sense, that we, in fact, all are apostles. Because the word literally means to be sent out, right? And we are sent out to scatter seed. So even though you may not be um, one of the 12 disciples, one of the apostles, even though you may not be uh, a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor, um, we all have this responsibility to scatter the seed of God's word. Uh, that is how the kingdom advances. And so, think about it as uh, you know, parents with children, for example. Um, well, we're told, uh, Deuteronomy 6, uh, these words that I command to you today shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Right? We are to teach God's word to our children. We are to sow those seeds. We're to scatter those seeds uh, among our own children. And then for all of us, even into our extended family, you, know, you may have family members uh, that you are burdened for, plant seeds, right? And it can come in various ways, um, depending on your relationship, depending on so many different factors. But you can, you can plant seeds of God's Word, plant seeds of the gospel in their lives. Uh, your friends and your neighbors, your co-workers, right? All, it's as if we're just casting out seed, and, and, uh, and, and we, we should be intentional to... Uh, do this um, um, in the places that God has placed us, among those whom God has placed us. And so um, that is a call for all of us to plant God's seed, to plant the word, and to do so with confidence, uh, knowing that it will not return void. And as we move on to the uh, second heading here, um, there's a good lesson that uh, I think is even especially uh, applicable for me, and I'm sure for many of you as well. And so this is resting in faith. And this is actually one of the things that shows that we really have a confidence in God's Word. Right? On, on one hand, we can show our confidence in God's Word by preaching and teaching or, or, or in whatever ways spreading the seed of God's Word into other people's lives. Um, but even in our rest, we can show this. Uh, look at verse 27. So after he scatters the seed, it says this, it says, He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. You know, if I really have confidence in God's Word, if I have the confidence that I claim to have, it should show not only in my labors, it should show not only in your labors, but also in mine and yours. In our rest. Have you thought about that before? How confidence in God's word shows not only in our labors, but also in our rest. And I know that for me, it doesn't always show in this way. You know, it is possible to have a laser sharp focus on the word and yet still lack faith and confidence in it. 
So you all know, you all know that I like to, I like to dig into God's Word, and I know that uh, that's true for a lot of you, uh, that uh, you, you, may, you may be very, um, uh, very interested in diving in and dissecting God's Word. That's a good thing, but that alone, that alone doesn't show adequate confidence in God's Word. And so I'm confessing to you that, uh, that um, one thing that I need to do better at is resting in it. And I wonder if that's true for some of you as well. Again, it is possible to have a laser-sharp focus on the Word and yet still lack faith or confidence in it. That is to say that our toil in the Word, it can become an anxious toil rather than a faith-filled toil. You see the big difference there? An anxious toil versus a faith-filled toil? This is the danger not only for pastors, but it is for anyone who scatters seed, right? Whether you're, whether you're scattering the seed of God's word and your children, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, sometimes, maybe you can relate to this, sometimes uh, if you're speaking God's word into people's lives and they're just not getting it and, and you, you, just, you just get frustrated, you say, why aren't they getting it? And it's easy to get impatient, and you just want to start like pounding it in, right? I, I, I just I don't see why they can't see this, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pound it in, and you begin to rely upon your own efforts, and rather than resting in God's word and letting God's word do its work, you uh, instead move along in anxious toil. We have to remember that we're not responsible for making the wheat grow. We can't. What does it say? It says, He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. We just plant the seeds and we let it do its work. There is a labor, right? There is a labor in planting seeds the seeds of God's Word into people's lives, but it's not, it's not an anxious toil. It is a faith-filled toil. And that's going to show up not only in how we work, but how we rest, how we rest in it. Let me read to you that Luther quote again that I, that I began with, and I want you to see how he, he likely had this passage in mind when he said it. So again, reflecting back on how the Lord used him to bring about reformation in the church, he says this. He says, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then, while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip of Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. And so he scattered seed, and he slept. Well, he also drank Wittenberg beer. <laughs> you know, I've, I, I said that I've seen this quote come up a number of times, and sometimes it'll have the first part of the quote, and it'll have dot, 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 and it'll have the last part of the quote. I just felt like I couldn't do that uh, with a good conscience, so I had, to share the, I had to share the full quote. I mean, he was, he was a German monk. Um, that's, just, that's just how it was for Luther, um, but don't, don't let that distract you uh, here, here in a Baptist church. Uh, the point is, Luther is saying that he, he rested in God's Word, right? He, he preached, he wrote, he taught God's Word, otherwise he did nothing. The Word did it all. So he had an unwavering confidence in God's Word, that extended even beyond his labors and into his rest. And I think that's what's key here. That's what we see in this quote. That's what we see in this passage, right? That, that, uh, that the kingdom of God is like one who goes and scatters seed, and then he sleeps and rises day and night, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. Right? There's something mysterious, even magical about it. Right? There is a self-contained power in the seed, in the Word of God, that does its work. 
And of course, I would add that uh, we, have, we have the Word of God and the Spirit of God working together. But again, this passage is really just focusing on the Word of God. And so we understand that, um, that there, there is a power in it, and there's a confidence that we must have in it that is going to show or ought to show, again, not only in our work, but even in our rest. And so that means that you're the loved one that, that, that you were so anxious about, right? Why, why won't they get it? Why won't they, why won't they just yield to God's word? And you just want to, you just want to pound it in and, and, and you, you start getting anxious and think, okay, what can I do? You, you speak the truth into their life. You speak God's word into their life. You look for those opportunities. There is a labor there, right? So it's not that we're just lazy. We just say, all right, well, God will take care of it. No, we labor in scattering the seed, but then we rest. We rest in it. It's kind of like Jesus. All right, remember the time that he slept in a boat in a violent storm. That's actually coming up uh, at the end of this chapter. Uh, Jesus, um, I mean, he was a man on a mission, right? He knew that a lot was at stake. But he goes and he preaches the word and he rests. So we might say that there are three kinds of people in this world. First, there are those who don't seem to trust at all in the power of God's Word. Right? Those who aren't even planting seeds. So we, people in the pews, right? maybe you're, you just come to church every Sunday and that's it. Maybe you don't even come to church every Sunday. But, but, but you're, you're not all that interested in, in, uh, in being a seed planter yourself. Um, and maybe you're not even all that interested in letting the word take root in your own life and bring about fruit. Whatever the case, for this person, there's not all that much trust in the power of God's word. And as I said, we see this not only with people in the pews, but we even see it with missionaries and evangelists and pastors, people who rely upon other means and other methods and maybe just a few Bible verses as a cherry on top, right? There's a lack of trust there in the power of God's word, right? We need other things. We need other things uh, in order to accomplish God's purposes, so there are those who don't seem to trust in the power of God's word at all. Second kind of person is those who trust in it enough to scatter seeds and sow, but then they fret about it until something happens, or they even try to force it. Maybe that's where a lot of us find ourselves. Right? Again, maybe, maybe you do love to dig into God's word and, 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 and to plant seeds of God's word in other people's lives, but then you fret about it. And again, you try, you try, to, you try to force it, and, and, and you're not able to rest in it and to really have a confidence that it's going to do what God intends for it to do. But then the third kind of person, so those who both labor in the Word and rest in it, trusting that it will accomplish that which God purposes. You want to be that third person where you, you scatter the seed and then you can sleep. You can rest because you really do trust that God's word has power. So Emily, that means that after I preach a sermon, when I come home and I say, oh, gosh, I can't believe I said that stupid thing, or I wish I would have said this clearer. You can remind me, and you can say, hey, you preach the word, and God's word will not return void. Do what? <laughs> yeah, I, I can go take a nap. Well, you know what? And there's some times where she can take a nap, and I can't. Right? So, so, so again, I'm telling you that, that I'm, I'm guilty here, Right? Like I said, you all know you all know that I love to dig into God's word, and 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 this is kind of uh, you know I've been here a year and a half now, but you know as we're, as we're you know making our way through the book of Mark, and um, we're kind of digging in in some ways that's uh, that's maybe new to some of you, and so I hope that that does communicate to you 
that I do care about God's Word, and I hope that it inspires you to, to really care and to trust in God's Word and the power of God's Word. But I'm also confessing that, uh, hey, I don't have it all together. That, uh, that, that that alone, just simply digging into God's Word alone, does not show the adequate confidence and faith that we ought to have in it. And so, uh, we got to get out of the way, right? I've got to get out of the way. You've got to get out of the way. And we, and we let the Word do its work. And so I'm sure, you know, you know some, some days I'm better, some days I'm worse. Some days I'm sure you're better at it, some days you're worse at it. Again, you think about uh, those, those loved ones in your life that you, that you fret about, and you say, okay, what can I do to, to, to really just pound it in, to really force this so they can get it? And that's when you got to step back. Or, or, or maybe, uh, kind of like the situation I just gave with myself, I say something stupid in a sermon. Maybe you have a conversation with someone, and you say something stupid, or you, uh, you, know, you uh, maybe wish that you had said something a different way. Trust, not only trusting in God's word, but we just got to trust in God, right? That God is going to um, take our efforts and he's going to use it, right? And, 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 and he's not going to let us mess it up. And so, so we can, in faith, um, speak God's word into someone else's life and trust that God will use it. Trust that the word itself, if the word of God is presented that that right there is, is a seed that has enormous potential, enormous power. So, we have the sowing, the sleeping, and then the reaping. Number three, reaping the harvest. I think I said everything I wanted to say there. Yeah. <clears throat> so the harvest, we have to understand, it doesn't... Um, typically come right away, right? Now, of course, uh, very first is conversion, or we can think of it in terms of that, right? We, we preach the Word. We want someone to, to turn in faith and repentance. We want them to trust in Jesus. I mean, that, that alone can sometimes take years, right? You're just planting seeds, and, and sometimes those seeds, they lie dormant under the ground, and, and, and it can take a long time, but then all of a sudden something sprouts up. Now, sometimes it happens more immediately. Conversion can come quickly. But certainly maturity takes time. Maturity always takes time. And that's really what the full harvest is, right? Look at verse 28. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. So there's a process It takes time. And then comes the harvest, verse 29. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. We've got some blackberries that we planted in our backyard just last year. And uh, I've actually been quite impressed with how quickly this plant has grown. Uh, there's a harvest coming. We're going to have a lot of blackberries this summer. We had to wait a year. In fact, and we would have had to wait a lot longer than that if we just planted a seed, right? Actually, I said, I think it was in the, the first of these seed parables that I said, you know, a lot of us, uh, we're not even really used to planting seeds because we just go buy the plant at Walmart and we put it in the ground, right? Um, and that's, that can take long enough, right? We, even then, sometimes we have to wait for the plant to grow and to mature until we finally have a harvest. Certainly, from a seed, it takes even longer, but I'm looking forward to that harvest. I'm looking forward to, to going out and picking some blackberries in my backyard. The harvest is a wonderful thing. But it comes in God's timing, doesn't it? It comes in God's timing. And sometimes we even have to be satisfied with someone else reaping the harvest. All right? You may be planting seeds in people's lives and you never get to see the result of it. So I have another example here. I think you, you've, you've heard me talk about this, about uh, in, uh, in my previous church in, in uh, Monroe City, Missouri, planted some peach trees there. And, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes when you get those trees at like Walmart, they'll have like the little tiny 
have, have some peaches on it, and so it gave me hope. I think they just glued those on there or something because, because uh, it was like four years. I had planted these trees for four years. They got nothing. Well, just uh, uh, I guess it was just this spring, um, my, uh, our neighbor there in Missouri, he took a picture full of, full of peaches, <laughs> okay? Now, this was the church parsonage, so the ch- church owns this home that, that, I, that my, me and my family lived in, and so now uh, their new pastor lives there, and he's able to reap the harvest of those peach trees that I planted, and so I should be happy for him that he gets all those peaches, you know, and I pray that not only does he reap the harvest of those peaches, but I pray that there's a spiritual harvest that he is reaping. You know, seeds that I planted there that maybe hadn't come to, to full fruition. Uh, in fact, and, and, and the reality is, is that the, the ultimate harvest doesn't come until the end, right? We all have um, this continuing path of sanctification. Um, but but I, I do pray that uh, there's also a spiritual harvest Uh, that he can reap, right? We have to be satisfied with other people harvesting what we have planted. Our call is simply to be faithful and to trust in God and in his word. So as we come to a close, I'll give one clarification, which I'm sure that you realize anyway, and that is that there is no guarantee that every seed planted will indeed sprout and mature. Right, there will certainly be many who do not accept God's word. Right, so script, scripture is clear about that, right? There are people who will hear the word of God. Those seeds will be planted, and yet they will reject it. So the question is, you know, I've, I've, I've made some vague quotations of uh, Isaiah 55, right? And, and you're probably all familiar with the passage. Many of you are, I'm sure, where, where God says, you know, my word will not return void. It will not return empty. And even in this parable, we see that there's this confidence that we have in the seed. But what kind of confidence is this if, 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 we, uh, if we can say that, oh, well, we know that not every seed will indeed sprout and bear fruit. If we know that people will hear God's word, that people will reject God's word, well, what is this confidence that we have in God's word? We have this promise that it will not return void. More specifically, though, the promise is that it will accomplish that which God purposes. Let me read to you the passage from Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. It says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. All right? God says that his word will accomplish that which he purposes. But we must understand that in dif- for different people, in different situations, this may be There may be different purposes. In fact, here in the context of Isaiah, this is God's word going to a rebellious people, and for many it meant judgment. So God's word may bring salvation, it may bring encouragement, it may bring comfort, it may bring guidance, it may bring warning, it may bring judgment. The point here is that God's word is going to do something, that it does have a self-contained power. And we ought to pray that it will indeed bring about salvation, and we want to reap a harvest of souls uh, that, uh, that have not only been saved, but have matured and grown in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and the Word of God has that power. Again, understanding it being coupled with the Spirit of God. But for some, it will be a warning and ultimately a judgment. And that's why Jesus says in these parables, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Do you remember just a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at uh, the, uh, well, let me just flip back here, in the uh, parable of the, the seed falling on different paths? 
And Jesus says that he speaks in these parables so that, and then again, this is once again the prophet Isaiah, that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. So uh, we see that God's word does, in fact, condemn those who do not have eyes to see, do not have ears to hear. And so he says, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. The word of God will not return void. It will accomplish that which it purposes. And we praise God that in our own lives, that by his grace, that it has fallen upon good soil, or at least I pray that that's true for all of us here this morning, that it has indeed fallen upon good soil on hearts that have been softened by the Spirit of God, and that, and that God's Word has grown up and borne fruit in our lives, and so we seek to see that as we plant God's seed, but ultimately we trust the results to God. And so we, we plant the seeds of God's words, we scatter the seeds of God's Word, and we leave it to Him. We leave it to him and to his word. And we trust him. With that, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for the power of your word. That because the power is in your word and not in us, that it can bring about such surprising results. And that while seeds might lie dormant for a time that uh, in due time there are sprouts and then eventually a full head of wheat, Lord, for the harvest. And so whether we see the harvest or, or not, we trust that you are growing your kingdom, that the gospel is advancing, and uh, we thank you for Uh, The part that we have in it is we scatter seed as we plant. Help us to toil in that, uh, but to do it with faith so that we can rest in you and confidence in you and in your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.